Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon, we will be uh, discussing the possible economic consequences of COVID-19 for South Africa. Of course, we know that there are um, quite severe economic impacts uh, given the lockdown, but some of the other factors that we will also be considering is how should we potentially go about um, intervening um, in the economy from a government perspective and in terms of what the Reserve Bank is doing. And furthermore, what are the options to start to unlock the economy? So those are some of the topics, what's going to happen to the economy potentially, what, what are the different impacts on the industries and what from year on forward. So first off, we will start with framing the crisis. Of course, it's first a humanitarian crisis and then economic. Secondly, the impact and scenarios we modeled. So there we will go into a little bit more detail about the economic modeling that we did as a team and what the impacts um, and, and the different scenarios are that we considered. Then uh, thirdly, the results of the economic um, impact modeling. And then finally, looking at uh, the policy interventions. Firstly, framing the crisis. First humanitarian and then economic. So unfortunately, South Africa's economy was already weak at the start of 2020. And we actually started the year in a technical recession after a 0.8% quarter on quarter de decline in quarter three and then a 1.4% decline in quarter four. And uh, then also in the budget, we realized that we would be nowhere near the 3% target that um, government generally wants to achieve with a budget deficit, but in fact that it would probably increase to around 6.8% with a public debt ratio or debt to GDP ratio um, going towards 70% plus. So all of that already a tough scenario to be in and also the reasons why and, and the main reason why we did uh, receive the downgrade from Moody's. It was definitely not a COVID-19 induced downgrade, it was rather a downgrade um, spurred by the economic situation which we are in. So what does that mean? It means that government has less room, fiscal room to manoeuvre and obviously to inject additional funding into the economy. And furthermore, it also means that when we do consider the contraction in the economy, we should see it of that low base. So basically already from a zero base and the economy is contracting from there. Whilst if we're looking at what is happening in other economies, we should remember and keep in mind that those economies were expected to grow. So that then gives one a little bit of a better understanding of some of the numbers and the quantum that we talk about. Just out of interest sake, we did look a little bit into uh, the COVID-19 um, shocks versus what has happened with the downgrade, because we, we try to understand um, what of the noise that we are currently seeing in the market was as a result of the downgrade and what was as a result of COVID-19. And I must say, it is actually quite difficult to understand. Um, actually, just after the budget speech, and if you look at the red line there, um, with the all index, we see that that severe deterioration in the global market started. So basically, that is when um, the rest of the world started reacting to the potential impact of COVID-19 when we saw that uh, the Chinese economy was shutting down, Italy was shutting down, large, large, large parts of Europe um, being shut down. And all of that, of course, having, having a contagion or a knock-on effect on our market. So we saw that massive drop uh, from the end of March until um, around, uh, from the end of February, sorry, until around the end of March. Uh, things have started to to turn the corner around um, in terms of the market, um, but uh, it's it's basically because of that massive overreaction. So therefore, you see that it's difficult to con you know to determine what what of that break at least in the in the all share uh, index and in the markets have been COVID driven, and what of it what portion of it was in fact as a result of um, the expected downgrade of Moody's. If we look at the 10-year bond yield, it's a little bit of a different picture. So again, um, when the moment that we saw our first uh, case being announced in South Africa, we started to see um, quite a climb in the 10-year bond yield, um, with bond yields actually 
um, reaching its highest levels in quite some time. And then the Reserve Bank actually stepping in um, just after the national lockdown has been announced to try and bring the, the yield back uh, by buying bonds on the market. So that has definitely helped. But um, then if you look at when the Moody's downgrade happened, the two of them almost happened simultaneously. So the lockdown and then the Moody's downgrade. So um, it's difficult to say, but probably a large portion of the Moody's downgrade being priced in um, just before we saw that actual downgrade. Um, the same with the RAND. The RAND is actually this whole year had a bit of a difficult run. Of course, uh, the rate of depreciation was a little bit faster, again, since I would say um, just after we we saw our first COVID-19 case. But I won't say that was necessarily South African related. I think, again, it's because of the, the shocks in the global market. And also, at the same time, the US and Europe um, seeing increased numbers uh, of COVID-19 and economies being locked down globally. Here, just a bit of an indication of the different points at which um, uh, foreign, foreign trade in bonds and equities um, reached negative outflow levels. So you would see in the first part of the year, actually, our bond market, we still saw um, inflows of, of money, so still people buying bonds. And then uh, just, I would say, a, a bit after the budget speech and before our first COVID-19 case, we started to move into that negative territory of people actually moving out of the bond market. Now, again, that could be um, as a result of the risk aversion globally, as well as the expected downgrade uh, by Moody's, but um, not, not a clear indication of which, which is which. So I would again say a combination of the two. And then if you look at the equity markets, we've basically been in the red since the beginning of the year um, with, with outflows in the equity market already starting then. And again, um, you know, the global stock market was already in a pretty jittery place towards the end of last year. And the trend started at the beginning of this year and then, of course, just got momentum um, with the COVID-19 crisis. So how do we look at this? How do we um, think about the economic interventions versus the healthcare interventions? I think economists and policymakers and healthcare professionals have figured out that, of course, the lockdown and the severe containment measures has an immediate negative impact on the economy and has the potential to actually um, make the impact on the economy worse because uh, we're in a situation where we've ne that we've never been in before with the economy just being shut down. And it's quite difficult to understand what the impact of that that could be. Um, on the other hand, let's say we made the decision not to shut down the economy, then the new cases would have spiked and of course put potential pressure on our healthcare system. And whilst initially the economic impact might not have been as dramatic, we don't know what the longer term impact would have been um, if the healthcare system in fact failed. So health, first priority of government, and then uh, we are now trying to put policies in place to actually reduce the economic impact and um, actually reduce the negative impact that the lockdown is having on the economy. Of course, it's not an easy decision to make to decide to end the lockdown. And um, we are currently in conversations as economists with government to actually come up with ideas to say, which part of the economy can we safely uh, restart or parts of the economy um, where we can put containment measures in place and also which parts of the economy are being damaged the most uh, by the lockdown situation. Now, it's interesting, again, economists are trying to figure out how quickly we will recover from an economic perspective from this. And you would have, hear, uh, you would have heard discussions around V-shaped and U-shaped and L-shaped recoveries over the last couple of weeks. <clears throat> now, just to put that into perspective, a V-shaped scenario, V-shaped recovery is where we have a very quick and deep shock um, and then the economy recovers completely and then continues on its old 
um, path after that. So we basically see a year worth of impact. And uh, at this point in time, it looks likely that China might be moving towards a V-shaped recovery, although um, I am, I am, um, I, I would say that it's probably depends very much on what happens in the rest of the global economy. So if you do like look at what has happened to China, we've seen a very sharp drop in their manufacturing capabilities, and then after that, a very quick recovery um, to actually to, to levels, I won't say pre-COVID-19 levels, but levels pretty close to that. But now the question is, China exports to other parts of the world, and if the export demand from those other parts of the world is not there, uh, what would that do to China's recovery? And at the end of the day, that's going to, de to determine whether or not China will see this V-shaped recovery. The U-shaped recovery, uh, taking a little bit longer, uh, probably a year and a half plus. To be quite honest, that's where we think South Africa is probably heading at the moment. Um, the growth of at least two years being affected and us not bouncing back uh, so quickly. And again, there's a couple of factors that play a role there. Uh, the state of our economy pre-COVID-19, the size of the, of the injections that government can make into the economy from a fiscal perspective. And then also we very dependent on exports, again, to countries like China. Um, it's all good if the demand for goods and services in China returns, but at the end of the day, um, our products and our mining products in, in particular are used as goods, in, as inputs into this production process in China. And if China can't sell their products, then the demand for our goods will not continue. So it looks likely that we probably won't be heading for this V-shaped recovery, but probably a longer term scenario. Now, the L-shaped recovery is really something where we don't want to get stuck. And that is where it takes longer um, than a year and a half to two years for the economy to start to recover. Unfortunately, there has been literature studies, and I mean, we haven't had that many pandemics over the years, but um, of the nature of COVID-19, at least over the last a couple of decades, but there are research uh, from, in particular, um, universities in New Zealand and in um, Europe and in Australia to say that it takes economies at least six to 12 quarters to recover after a pandemic. So if we say six quarters, U-shaped scenario, 12 quarters, then we are in the so-called L-shaped scenario where the economy is permanently stuck um, at a lower level of output of where it was uh, before the crisis. And that is really something that we want to invade, uh, um, uh, prevent and, and government would, would, would want to prevent. And that would mainly come from a reduction in both investment and consumpt consumption uh, on a permanent basis or a very prolonged basis rather. So most of you would probably remember the circular flow diagram from Economics 111. And this diagram basically just is a way in which we thought about the different places in which um, the economy is broken after COVID-19 and where COVID-19 has impacted the economy. Um, in terms of households being able to pay, to pay taxes, in terms of um, payments to the rest of the world uh, in, for, for imports and exports, international supply chains, domestic supply chains, uh, businesses actually uh, being bankrupt, um, labor layoffs and reduced hours, and then also an impact on the financial sector through the banks uh, if businesses and households can't continue re to repay uh, their debts. So what has the South African government spent to date um, on COVID-19? From what we could have calculated, it's around 1.1% of GDP or 59 billion uh, in terms of fiscal commitments. Now, nobody has yet uh, questioned this number. We also discussed it with National Treasury. It seems that it's kind of in the ballpark. And you would see there that South Africa is the, um, the bright green block there on the graph. And we way towards the, the bottom end of, of the graph with developing countries spending around 2.8% uh, of GDP 
and uh, all countries that we have information for around 3.3%, with the US uh, spending in ex excess of 12%, and then some of the highest packages that we've seen in, in countries like Qatar or Malta. But we also looked at what does that mean per capita, um, in terms of what we spend per capita, and you'll see that the countries there on top, similar, uh, Qatar, the US, the United Kingdom, uh, six or seven dollars per capita, um, the amount here is in dollars. Um, the average one dollar twenty three, and South Africa right at the bottom there, um, with only seven cents per person from a fiscal perspective. There are of course monetary um, monetary interventions that that has already been announced as well. I spoke briefly about uh, the Saab intervening in the bond market by buying up bonds. And then, of course, um, we also know about the two interest rate reductions that we've seen over the last month. <clears throat> so what has happened in the global economy? How has COVID-19 impacted the global economy? Firstly, um, if we look at the US, massive increase in jobless numbers and jobless claims, so a massive increase in unemployment. Um, to give you an idea, um, in the 2008 financial crisis, the highest number of claims recorded on a weekly basis in the US was 660,000. And uh, in the last week of March, that number um, went up to 6.6 .6 million uh, now during COVID-19. So 10 times as much as what we saw at its height in the global financial crisis. And at the beginning, or towards the end of March and the beginning of April, there's already been 17 million extra people that said that they needed um, access to, to uh, unemployment insurance in the US. Um, US GDP forecast, very big um, ranges of numbers that we're seeing there. So for quarter two, the contraction anywhere between nine and 40%. But the expectation for the year is that the US economy will contract by around 6% or thereabouts um, from an expected growth of about 2%. So <clears throat> the total contraction, if you if you look at that, the 2% plus an additional 6% is, is basically an 8% reduction in US GDP. Um, in China, as I said initially, we saw quite a fast recovery um, in manufacturing numbers. But uh, unemployment still at its highest levels uh, since February or uh, on record in February 2020. And uh, we'll have to see if this is a sustained improvement in the situation in China. If we look at the Eurozone, um, the Eurozone actually also expecting quite a difficult year. And that, of course, not good news for South Africa because it's our largest export market. Um, and in fact, um, the German economy, for one, expected to contract by as much as 9% this year. And then our other trading partners in the US, oh, uh, the UK, sorry, and then uh, France, uh, of course, also expecting contractions in the region of about 6 to 7%. So what are the scenarios that we modeled? Um, as we go through the graphs, maybe just to give you a little bit of, a, of an understanding of what you will see there. First of all, we looked at the impact of COVID-19 on the economy without taking into account any fiscal injection from government or any um, fiscal in, or any other injection from, um, from the Saab through monetary policy. So purely just based on what we think will happen on the economy. Then we looked at, uh, at different scenarios uh, about how it could play out, uh, different lockdowns, full, partial, etc. Then um, the next step was, we know that there are interventions, so what could the positive impact of this be? Then looking at options for partial lockdown and which sectors can, can we open up and how demand might look like. And then lastly, are there any positives that could come out of this for any sectors in the economy, like manufacturing or local manufacturing, uh, sorry, like communication or local manufacturing of healthcare products? So how do we see COVID-19 in the economy? Firstly, the disruption in the supply chain, so in terms of exports and imports, then labour supply um, as a result of the reduction 
uh, of employee years being able to work or unable to work. Um, in South Africa, unfortunately, a very large portion, almost 75% of the economy, can't really successfully work from home. It's different, let's say, from a country like the US or UK, where there are vast parts of the economy that can actually still continue with people working from home. So, of course, for South Africa, um, those impacts will, will be even more exacerbated. And then business confidence and consumer confidence being negatively impacted. Firstly, businesses um, being forced to shut down. A lot of them won't necessarily have the capital to carry them through this period or if we have a prolonged sh shutdown. Uh, consumers worried potentially about their jobs or uh, taking salary cuts or not getting um, the income if they are entrepreneurs or work for themselves. And um, the question is, of course, once the economy starts up again, whether that consumer demand will return and how quickly. Um, somebody described it the other day. It's almost like two people standing and watching each other through a, through a glass window. Um, one on the, on the one side needing a product and the other one on the other side having the product, but they can't get to each other. So that's what the lockdown situation has led to. And then, of course, the, the damage is not only during the lockdown. The economy won't just be uh, just restart as if nothing happened. It will take um, time for business and consumer confidence to get back up. And also in certain sectors like manufacturing and mining, there are huge costs involved in getting the economy going again. Then the impact on sectors that's been completely locked down, like uh, certain parts of the retail sector, the tourism industry actually feeling the impact even before um, the lockdowns. And then lastly, policy interventions uh, from the government or so. I'm not going to go through all of these scenarios in detail. You can look at the uh, specific detail of the assumptions that we've included, but what I can say is that um, we looked at three scenarios. One, um, a three-week three, three full lockdown and a two-week partial lockdown. So we were hoping that government would start to um, announce some lifting up some of the lockdown measures this week already. Uh, we do know that mining and certain parts of the mining industry is restarting. So hopefully that would become more over the next two or so weeks. In the second scenario, a three-week full lockdown and a five-week partial lockdown, so an eight-week lockdown. Um, and I think we will probably end up somewhere between the mild and the medium scenario uh, because uh, government has made it clear that they are looking at lifting lock, uh, the lockdown in, um, over, over time and gradually. And we do think that some of it will, will already start to happen this week, but uh, definitely we won't be back to normal at the end of this five-week period. And then just as a severe scenario, three-month lockdown, and that's our so-called L-shaped recovery, um, with a 12-month gradual improvement in the economy, uh, but with business and consumer confidence actually remaining suppressed uh, throughout the remainder of the calendar year and beyond. So that's if business and consumer confidence don't return to reasonable levels anytime soon, even in the next two or so years. And that's really a, a very severe scenario. We don't think it's likely that we'll end up there. I think it's most likely that we will probably end up somewhere between the mild and the medium scenario that we have there. And the policy responses. We've already mentioned government's policy response um, of uh, 39 billion stimulus in the economy. In the second scenario, we assumed a larger stimulus of 2.8% um, of GDP, and in the last scenario, 3.3% of GDP. And then on this slide, uh, just some of the sectors where we um, where we think there will be, you know, some reopening happening. We already mentioned mining. Um, hopefully, automotive exports at some stage as well. Uh, agriculture exports. Some of the construction projects that were already on, on the go before COVID-19, uh, some a broader range of online retail, maybe vehicle sales. We've heard some relief in terms of hardware and paint, but it seems it's mainly just for plumbers and electricians needing access to, to, um, to hardware and, and so on. 
And then we're thinking that the communication sector might get a small boost um, in terms of the increase in data revenue, but it won't be significant enough to really make a, a very big difference in the economic um, conditions in South Africa. We're wondering if restaurant takeaway activities might restart. All of this, of course, depends on whether or not it could be safely done. Um, food manufacturing, uh, of course, is continuing. Um, and then uh, the transport sector being linked to all of these could also benefit um, in terms of if the economy st start or restarts again. Professional and other related services, we're thinking is already running mostly um, at, uh, at at least 80 or so percent capacity because most of us can work from home. And then if there is a potential benefit from localization and local manufacturing, um, if we start producing uh, protective, personal protective equipment or PPEs, the masks, etc., in South Africa, it could be a small boost for the economy. But again, at this point in time, it's so small that we don't really think it would have a very significant impact. But we did um, include all of these as well as a potential uh, positive uh, for the economy if we can start to open up the economy slowly but surely. So, um, how do how do you need to consider the graphs? As I said, we start out with the full result without any interventions. Then we look at the fiscal policy interventions, monetary policy interventions, and then any potential impacts of certain sectors starting to open up earlier. So what you see on the graph there in front of you is uh, the impact of uh, the full interventions on the economy without uh, any other factors being taken into account. If we do take into account um, the monetary policy interventions, so with the full interventions before anything, minus 11.2%, with the fiscal and monetary policy interventions, minus 8.8%, .8, and if we start to lock, unlock the economy earlier, minus 87 So basically what we're saying to each other is that in the mild scenario, the economy would probably contract at, um, at very close to 9%. In the next graph, um, there is the full impact at 13% and then after the monetary and fiscal policy interventions minus 10.6 and then if we can partially start to unlock the economy minus 10. And in the severe scenario I'm going to mention it um, really the, the worst that things could get and we don't think we will get there it's very unlikely minus 21 and then if we start to include um, uh, some other partial um, lockdown um, interventions and monetary policy, it moves to around minus 16%. But we believe that we will probably end up somewhere between the mild and the medium scenario, probably closer to the, to the mild scenario. The impact on jobs, uh, this, is, this is also pretty scary. Around a million jobs to 2 million jobs in the formal sector being at risk and then another 2.9 million informal employees uh, that will be in a precarious employment situation uh, as defined by Stats SA. So unfortunately our model can't take into account the informal sector employees. We can only look at the formal sector impacts and uh, Therefore, it is important to remember there are 2.9 million people that are in precarious employment situations as well, which you could potentially add on top of these numbers. So anywhere between a million and 2 million formal sector jobs with an additional 2.3 million um, informal and contract type jobs also being on the line. And that would mean that um, the unemployment level in South Africa could go towards um, 45 40 to 45%, unfortunately. In terms of the fiscal deficit, unfortunately also um, not a good picture. That 6.8% looks like a dream scenario in terms of what we're looking at at the moment. At least a 10.5% deficit. Um, and in the medium scenario, at least an 11.5% deficit and at least a 14.5% deficit 
in the severe scenario. If we look at the specific impacts on sectors, and this is in quite a bit of detail, so you can go through it and look at the sectors that, that are of particular interest to you. Um, if we look at agriculture and mining, agriculture coming out of it a little bit better than a lot of other sectors, mining unfortunately being very severely negatively impacted. Uh, manufacturing, also again if you look at food manufacturing, should be okay-ish, but still not necessarily uh, much better off than the rest. And uh, if we further look at the rest of the manufacturing sector, uh, textiles and, 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 and furniture, etc., very severe negative impacts, unfortunately, that we're seeing across the board there. Um, and still continuing uh, with the manufacturing sector, rubber products, machinery and equipment, communication and other medical equipment, because remember, we're not if you just think about cell phones, for example, we're currently not selling any any of that. Not that we manufacture a lot of cell phones, but but um, other communication equipment in South Africa, and then transport equipment, um, vehicle manufacturing, very negatively impacted. Unfortunately, minus 30.8, and that is one of the sectors that we really rely on in terms of exports. If we move, move to some of the other sectors, interestingly enough, electricity. Um, if you look at ESCOM's demand at the moment under lockdown, um, it is that so much that we can basically equate it to stage nine um, uh, rolling blackouts or, yeah, it's equal basically to stage nine rolling blackouts, which, um, which means that they are saving and that we don't see the rolling blackouts, but, um, and the load shedding, of course, but it's still... Uh, not good news in terms of the revenue side for ESCOM. Construction also quite negatively impacted. Wholesale and retail trade, what's pulling it up is, of course, food and then other products that should continue, but still uh, negative numbers that we're seeing there. Catering and accommodation, um, that's restaurants, etc. Uh, one of the largest negative impacts that we're seeing with minus 35%. And then if we go down the list, um, down to tourism minus 10. Now, tourism, uh, the reason why it's it's not more negative is because there are a proportion of spending on tourism um, that could come back in the form of domestic tourism if that starts to recover. And then um, portions of spending on tourism related to food and so on um, could also help boost it a little bit. But um, where you would see the biggest impact coming through, of course, is, as I've already said, there in terms of catering and accommodation, which are the hotels, um, guest houses, restaurants, etc. So what can we see from this economic model? Um, South Africa is quite exposed to countries like uh, China, Germany, the US, the UK and India in terms of our export markets and um, our ability to recover and to start exporting those goods again uh, will be very definitely impacted by the demand in those markets. And as I already said, um, although the Chinese economy looks like it has rebounded to some extent, Germany and the US and the UK still going through the worst of COVID-19. In the sectors, of course, it's being mostly negatively impacted mining, vehicle exports, uh, fruit, etc. And we are concerned about uh, the continued um, low levels of production in the mining sector in particular, and then also vehicle exports, because we need those to start generating foreign reserves for the country. Um, key sectors being impacted uh, in the lockdown and for the remainder of the year, um, accommodation, transport, finance and insurance, unfortunately, as well, because it's so linked to all other exports in the economy. The factor that would be most important to take into account, um, into, or factors that's most important, is the lack of business confidence and resulting reduction in business investment. But that, of course, is in response to reduced consumer demand. So what we're saying is, Business confidence, if we can not get that back up and um, if we can't get consumer demand back up to, to reasonable levels, that could get us stuck in that so-called L-shaped recovery. And uh, that is dangerous territory. So 
what uh, what we as economists are taking to government in terms of interventions is first of all make sure that people are are healthy then secondly make sure that you support household income in some level thirdly make sure that you support businesses in some way and then finally ensure the stability of the financial um, financial sector and um, the stability of the fin- of the banks and the reserve bank etc in terms of jobs, yes, a lot of formal shop, uh, formal sector jobs on the line, but around 2.9 billion million, sorry, jobs in the informal sector also potentially um, at risk. So what should government do? Um, first of all, the interventions should target the immediate pain pain points and should be timely, and that's where. We have concern at the moment. Uh, there are significant backlogs in terms of the UIF claims that's been made. Um, payouts has been slow. Some parts uh, of other interventions like, like the Solidarity Fund that's been um, that's been structured and managed by the private sector. There we've seen um, quick interventions, and on the healthcare side, there's also been reasonably quick interventions by government. But unfortunately, in terms of supporting business and supporting households, it's not been as fast as we would have liked to see. Um, And uh, we're actually hoping to hear some more news today around what some of the interventions could be. Um, It should be impactful. Uh, Prioritise interventions with the highest returns. Prioritise sectors that are the most vulnerable to job losses and business failure and prioritize sectors and interventions that con- can contribute most to job creation and growth. And here it's important that we start thinking about what will happen to the economy after COVID-19. So we are having conversations around um, how to unlock the economy and, and there's three aspects to that. The first is um, the economic value of sectors, then secondly, the economic risk of those sectors, and then thirdly, How do we overlay the healthcare components? Which sectors can we safely start to unlock um, through different interventions and protocols? And uh, if those three come together, then we know where we can start unlocking the economy. And that should preferably happen as fast as possible. And then beyond that, the next step is understanding where should the South African economy go um, after COVID-19? And um, what we do know is that we will probably live in a very different world. Um, You will also hear later today from Johan around uh, digitization and the impact that that will have on our lives and the way that you do your work as well. I think we've all been forced into digitization over the last couple of weeks. And um, some of the trends that we've seen globally is just going to pick up speed. So... Digitization being one of them, but then other factors such as a nearshoring or the focus on, um, I, I almost want to call it nationalism. I'm, and I'm saying that carefully because one needs to, um, it's not necessarily something that, that we hope to see a trend of more and more. But I think over the last couple of years, we've seen um, that absolute focus and, and countries starting to turn in internally. If you look at Brexit, for example, if you look at the way in which Trump is leading the US at the moment, putting America first, um, countries will have to and try and look after themselves first. And even in South Africa, that would be something that we would see. So for us, we can actually take the opportunity and say we needed to reindustrialize our economy quite some time ago, and now is the actual time to do it. And uh, that... We should focus on sectors um, that can that can potentially do that. And those might be sectors that are very different from the ones that we used to focus on in the past. In the past. Um, we'll have to rethink the role that mining play, plays, for example. We need to rethink the role of the vehicle manufacturing. It's such an important industry for South Africa. How do we continue to do that? Tourism will look completely different. Um, it will take months, if not years, for the tourism sector, in particular international tourism, to get back to to normal levels. So the question is, um, how do we, in the meantime, support local and domestic tourism and get the domestic tourism sector going again? Because it's an extremely important sector in terms of creating jobs for South Africa. Um, 
then how do we stimulate both supply and demand? How do we put money back in the hands of households so that they can go out and, and buy basic goods and services and businesses can respond by actually starting manufacturing those again and selling them again? We should also focus on things that are easy to implement over, over the immediate short term. Um, I'm just thinking about um, some of the interventions that has been announced and how we're struggling, for example, with um, distributing money through the UIF. Um, so it's really important that we should not actually come up with, with new mechanisms. We should make use of um, existing mechanisms. And it's important for government to actually continue communicating and building confidence. Unfortunately, the fact that they didn't come up with a lot of interventions and next steps last week uh, during the cabinet meeting was a little bit of a disappointment. And um, whilst they've handled the healthcare part of this really, really well up to now, in my opinion, where the challenge is coming in is how do we restart the economy? And that's where we, we're getting stuck at the moment. But on a positive note, um, there is a lot of discussions taking place where the private sector and government is really open uh, to the suggestions that's being taken to them. And then, of course, now that we announce all these new measures, we need to make sure that it's not permanently built into the economy because we cannot afford that. And um, it, it, at the end of the day, will make that fiscal position even worse. So it should be measures that we can implement to get people or businesses back on their feet, uh, but then after that, um, try and get back to, to some semblance of normality in terms of tax collections, etc. I really want to thank you uh, for listening today, and I'm hoping that we can engage further. I'm looking forward to your questions and discussions around this. Uh, you see the team there that worked on this model. There's an, a, a lot of other people included in the team, but that's the main, main team. You have our contact details there, and uh, please do feel free to get in touch and to discuss this with, with us further. But hopefully we will also now have a, a nice discuss, a discussion after the presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, tax portion of this afternoon's webinar. My name is Johan Heidenrich. After the bleak picture that Lulu have painted for us on the economic front, um, I suppose there's a bit of a bleak picture potentially that is facing us from a tax front as well. Some time ago, I attended the presentation by Professor um, Ken Stein from the University of Pretoria, who, who uh, presented his doctorate thesis to us. And he started off his talk about the history of taxes and, and where taxes actually originated. And I thought, um, let me look at what the Encyclopedia of Britannica has to say on this and what induces the payment of taxes. And it's quite interesting that taxes initially started with more indirect taxes and that income tax was originally only raised in order to fund wars. So um, this was uh, what I was starting to think about is that over the past three weeks or so, we've been talking about uh, access to government grants, access to ETIs, access to TERS and the like, but somewhere this has to be funded. So the question comes in, how will the government fund this, this current war effort? Because as you can see, wars have been influenced as uh, influenced taxes more than taxes have influenced revolutions. Um, so uh, I couldn't help but thinking back to 1994. And in 1994, obviously we had the first democratic elections, but at that time to fund that transition, there was a transition levy of 5% imposed. Uh, for individuals, it was imposed in two tranches. For the 1995 year, there was a 3.33% levy. And then for the next year, 96, it was a 1.67% um, um, levy uh, on, on individuals. For companies, it was a 5% levy for the 95 year, and it was before the offset of assessed losses. So it was just on that current year taxable income. So I was just wondering whether... Uh, in some way, we could be looking at some kind of levy uh, in order to fund this effort from, from government. So whereas we as tax professionals be looking now in order to utilize the, the tax breaks and the tax benefits and the tertiary benefits and the like, um, in six months or a year, perhaps we'll be looking at managing this kind of extra funding that's required by the government. I thought that um, from, from a tax position, there has been the, the biggest thing that have affected us is the use of the, the digital economy. 
Um, none of us would be sitting here if it was not for the digitization of the economy. We could sit here, do a webinar, we can we can communicate with each other, we can communicate with our clients, we can submit tax returns, we can do VAT returns and the like. And I, th I think that, that before the COVID-19 period, obviously there was a bit of a stigma on technology because it, it on the one side, it was very good for, for efficiencies and effectiveness, but the other side, it definitely cost jobs. But I think the COVID-19, the technology is seen as a savior in this regard, because it's not only a question, if it was not for technology, we would have not been able to operate in remotely at all. So I thought, let us talk about the digitization of the economy and the impact of that on, on tax policy, on the taxpayer and us as a profession, and um, where that is going. It is interesting, there is a tech, tech crunch I've noted, um, Uber, the world's largest taxi company owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb and Breakfast, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. So the di digitization of the economy is with us. And I, and I just went through my, my phone and I looked at all the apps that I have on the phone and, and I looked at what there is. And, and it is quite amazing how the how technology has affected our, our daily lives. And this is the digitization of the economy. If you want insurance quotes, you don't go to insurance broker, you just go to Hippo. If you, if you want to read a book, you go to Kindle. If you want to travel, if you want to book a car or you go to Travel Start, if you want to hear music, you don't go to a store, you go to iTunes. If you want training, you can go to Oxford University online or you can go to tax faculty. All the, what we are doing here is digital clothing even even something like online fitness coaches um as as well as online medical advice that one can get uh, it's interesting to note now over the COVID 19 period the the american authorities have relaxed the the regulations around telemedicine so even medical assistance you can get online nowadays um if you want to rent property go to property 24 if you want to movies netflix and as you can see the whole the whole economy has changed. The whole way in which you do business have changed. Even something like re religion, uh, one can get married online in certain certain countries. And even if you're Roman Catholic, there's an app on which you can do confessions. So, so technology have, have changed our way that we operate even on a religious basis. From a tax perspective, there's numerous supplies of online um, solutions and online automated VAT returns primarily. Um, and the indirect tax has been a, a, a bit more on the, on the front line of the automation of it. Um, Source e-funding is obviously also a, an example, a critical example of the digitization of the economy. So it's interesting. I looked, uh, I looked again online and I, and I could see what uh, an article that Deloitte in Malta have, have produced. The mere fact that I can, can quote an article produced by Deloitte in Malta and Malta's uh, island with 500,000 people is a representative of how accessible information and knowledge have been become. So what does Deloitte and Malta say? They say, what is the digital economy? It is the economic activity that results from billions of everyday online connections amongst people, business, devices, data, and processes. And the backbone of that is hyperconnectivity, where people can interconnect seamlessly with each other. So it is it's taking shape. But what Deloitte is saying is that it's undermining the conventional notions about how businesses are structured. And this is quite important because technology is changing the way that we are working, the way that firms interact, how consumers obtain services. Also talk about the future of work. People regularly work from different offices, their home or local coffee shop. So where your employees would have been in, in, in office and your concept of supervision and control, you can walk around, you can see that they're doing their jobs. Now they're remote, you can't see them. So the concept of supervision and control becomes different. You now need to, to uh, how do you make sure that they are working and they're not just drinking coffee? You need to have access to whether they're online or not online. You have to measure output as opposed to input. Um, and the whole concept of our supervision and control is exercised because you can't just rely on, on, on trust um, because there needs to be some kind of supervision or control over, over your people. It's also, how does it impact the recognition and reward concepts? Um, it becomes less important about how to interact in, in person with a person, but, but also how, how do you interact on a digital basis? The customer experience still needs to be ex uh, ex excellent because the customer still wants 
and, and, and interaction. But now online and digital uh, etiquette becomes more important. Um, and as well as the impact on the risk profile, because if you have 2,000 employees, everything that is happening has got a record. Every email there's a record of. So now your employees, if they even give an advice to a client and they merely copy you on it, does it mean that you have bought into that advice? Do you mean that you agree with it? Um, and digital etiquette becomes much more important. Who should be copied on certain things? What should you do, do when, when you are to CC it on, on a document? So everything, everything is, is changing through this. So in this short talk, I want to talk about the impact on the taxpayer, uh, SARS and, and the global tax authorities, the, the, the impact on the authorities that is tasked with actually administering the taxes. And then how is it impacting tax policy? And then obviously lastly, the impact on the accounting and the tax advisory profession. So first, let's look at the impact on the taxpayer. The large taxpayers, the multinational entities, are more and more move to shared service centers, mainly to, to save costs, uh, but also to, to create efficiencies and standardization of processes. If you operate uh, in 100 countries in the world, um, you want to standardize process for submitting bank returns. And for that, it's not only themselves that may be doing bank returns, they may, they may outsource it to a particular organization who can do those bank returns for them, but they're looking at shared service centers in order to do this globally. And as the global, for especially things like VAT has become more standardized, a lot of that processing can be done uh, centrally. Also financial statement preparations, um, the maintenance of, of um, accounting records, monthly um, reports. So all of, all of them are at least considering moving to large service centers. And that is changing the way that we need to interact because if I didn't need to do a tax return previously, I can go to the financial manager and ask for all the information. Now that, that financial may be sitting in Budapest or it may be sitting in, in, uh, in India. Also, the impact on taxpayers, small businesses are also operating globally. Um, the problem is that the small businesses have, have, don't have necessarily the access to the tax expertise that the larger businesses have. Physical location barriers are irrelevant. And especially once we look at, uh, at personal services, one can render personal services anywhere in the world through the technology. And uh, the, the, the small business may be creating a presence in that country with even out, without even knowing about it. And all of this has led to increased uncertainty for the global tax liabilities, even for the larger businesses. Because transfer pricing is effectively a battle between governments. And it's not applied consistently by tax authorities. So you may have a company situated in Germany that's charging a management fee to South Africa. They believe it is, it is arm's length. They do the pricing and the benchmarking from a German perspective. But the focus of the German authorities is different than the focus of South African authorities. The focus of German authorities is that the, that may be understated from a South African perspective. The question is, is this management fee uh, overstated? So it's not applied consistently. So you often lead with, with, um, with especially transfer pricing policies that's not applied consistently. And there's a lack of, of case law globally on, on transfer pricing. The permanent establishment test and the VAT present test have, have become outdated because they do not reset, necessarily reflect economic presence. And they're also vague uh, because the present tests are, are based on, on, on a, an old models. So the reality is that business have evolved, but tax legislation have become outdated. And, and because of this outdated, there's, there's increasing uncertainty for, for global companies. And as they publish their global uh, tax numbers, what has also happened is that the public has, has an outcry and say, how can you pay so little tax globally? That has also led that global companies are preparing uh, so-called uh, tax reports where they say our contribution to the tax coffers in the various uh, jurisdictions is not limited to income tax. But look at what we are paying through employment taxes. Look at what we are paying through um, uh, the municipal taxes and what we are paying through value added tax and the like. So they, they are preparing tax reports from a social responsibility perspective. So the taxpayer has been coming more under scrutiny if they, in accordance with, with public perception, is not paying the fair share of, of, of the taxes. And for that, they've started to prepare tax, tax reports. The impact on the tax authority, now remember, the tax authority is, is, is tasked to administering the law. They can't make the law, but they must administer the law. And the question is, how can they do this in, in the digital economy where there's economic activity without physical presence? Who do they audit? They can see, for example, there's an Uber 
and you want to now audit Uber. But how do you audit Uber? They've got no presence, no physical presence in South Africa. Or you want to audit a travel store. How, how, how do you audit them? Um, you, you can't go and interview somebody. So all of this has, has changed the way in which they need to, to operate. The, 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 the tax base are operating globally. So how do you know what is this? So the first thing that tax authorities have done, also through the tax legislator, is to, cry, to, to increase visibility. Uh, country by country reports, master files, focal files, and through this, your tax authorities have access to to master files whenever there is an exchange of information, um, and country by country reports. So master file in particular will give you the economic activity in a particular country, and it will give you, for example, the the sales per person. So if you look and you have visibility through a group's uh, <clears throat> uh, information, and you can see. The income per employee in South Africa is, for example, uh, 100,000 rand per employee in South Africa, but in Mauritius, it is a million rand per person in South Africa. Clearly, immediately, the tax authorities can say, but is there something wrong? Should I now be looking at whether there's a movement of profits to Mauritius uh, at the expense of South Africa? So the first thing that the tax authorities are asking is more visibility. And for that, over the past two years, there's been filing for master files, local files, country by country report, and, and the like. The tax authorities are investing significantly in technology. Obviously, South Africa has for a long time been in the forefront, especially in, in, in Africa, uh, through the e-filing, which, which is a significant investment in technology. But that's not really where, it, where it's just stopping. It's not just investing in technology in order to administer the tax for you, for your filing on file um, online and where you have uh, your um, objections and your appeals online and the like, but also in the way that they try to do audits where they start investing in, in sophisticated, sophisticated data analytics. And South African Revenue Service have been done, doing this for years, maybe not at the level that they could. I had the privilege of attending a conference where the, um, the Deputy Commissioner for Internet Revenue of Brazil made a presentation. And he talked about how data analytics have revolutionized the way in which they can do an audit. And he compared it to moving into a, a totally dark room and in the past you would only have a flashlight you take a flashlight and say okay where do i shine this flashlight okay i think there may be a risk on stock valuations or there may be a risk on doubtful debt provisioning and you take a flashlight and you look at doubtful debt provisions and you take but you have got no visibility about the rest on the room and what is going on you see once they've invested in sophisticated data analytics and once they do an audit based on this basis where they download the information, they download the general ledger of the clients, it is as, as if you're going to a room and it's totally lit up and immediately the non-compliant issues just lit up. And this is a reality. This is the way audits will be done. This is the way requests for information will be done. And the tax authorities are investing into sophisticated data and ethical capabilities. And the taxpayer themselves needs to ask themselves, is it, should we not also invest into, into that analytical capabilities? Because it is the good thing that SARS knows more about my business than I will know myself. What I want is, in, is, is quite an important one. There, there's a distinct move away from, from batch reporting. Uh, so batch reporting has, has been long gone from an accounting perspective, and it has. But once you prepare your VAT, it's nothing more than batch reporting. You take all the transactions in a month, collate it all, and prepare one collective batch reporting of what your output batch, what your input batch, what's the net amount that you make, and you submit that on a monthly basis. And the same applies for, for PAYE. So there's a distinct move away from that, because if you think about it, the technology is sophisticated enough, is that um, as, you, as you pay for a specific service, or as you issue invoice for a specific service, that, that's, that transaction can go through a source system, and that can be paid immediately to source instead of being paid at the end of the month. The technology exists. Um, in the past three weeks, personally, I've not, made, I've not made one single payment in cash. Everything has been done electronically. So there's no reason why, as this money moves through a bank and as you are a VAT registered vendor, that what will happen is that invoice that you issue can move through a, 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 a tax authority system Immediately, your VAT number can be verified. Immediately, the VAT can transfer from your bank account into the source bank account. If you want to claim an input VAT, then immediately, as you want to claim it, it is 
automatically linked between the supplier and the, pur and the purchaser. That invoice is immediately matched to make sure that the supplier is actually paying that back to source, and it can go through the system. So that will absolutely take away the, the, the need for audits uh, on the current way that we're doing. Because um, the one thing that Sars have, have mentioned is that is that there's been increased in, in VAT fraud over the past three weeks. So uh, if you if you can invest in the technology and you can move away from a VAT system of, of reporting VAT, then all of that will move away. There's already registered use in Russia and most of Southern, um, um, Southern America where you are required to have a specific register um, in order to do business. And that register will verify every transaction from a VAT perspective, and that will interface with the SAR systems. So it's a move to real-time transaction verification and compulsory transaction reporting via tax authority systems. And that is not that far away because the technology does exist. And then also increased collaboration amongst countries to address products. So the, the tax authorities globally are, are moving quite, quite quickly in, into adopting this and in order to manage the, the digitization of the economy. And, and us as tax practitioners, we need to know that this, this is a real, um, a, a real issue that is coming. It is not a question of whether it's coming, but it's a question of when it is coming. So how does this, this uh, uh, digital, digital economy actually affect tax policy? In the Digital Economy Report in 2019 um, of the United Nations Conference of Trade Development, the following was, was said. This is an extract of that report. Taxation is another key concern for value capture. Countries are rethinking how taxation rights should be allocated to prevent possibilities for under-taxation of major digital platforms in the fast-evolving digital economy. So this is important. Observers have noted a mismatch between your profits are currently taxed and where and how value is created. So we can give an example. If you are a musician and, and you, um, you record a song, you write the song, you, 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 and you record the song, and it is an instant hit, and you record it. And you may be uh, uh, in Belgium. So you're sitting in Belgium, you've done all your activities in Belgium, and now that, that song becomes a global hit. And you sell a, music, uh, a million uh, songs in South Africa, and you sell five million in, in Australia and 10 million in America. Currently, where you're supposed to tax it is where you've applied your mind. We've actually thought out the song. That's the source of it. So theoretically, from an income tax perspective, you should now be taxed in, in Belgium. But with the digitization of the economy, what really is adding the value, the fact that you are thinking out the song and writing the song and recording the song? Or is it where you're marketing the song? Is it where your customers are situated? Or is it where you are situated? And people are saying there's a mismatch because more and more, because it's so accessible, that it should actually be taxed in South Africa and America and in Australia and the like, because that is really the source of that income. That is really where the value is created is where the customers are situated. It becomes even more complex because now you market it through iTunes, and then iTunes is saying, well, where's my server? My server may be in India, my server may be in um, the USA, wherever that server is, they argue that that is the source of it. But is that really the source of it, or is it where the customers of iTunes is? And um, so the report goes on saying, as developing countries are mainly markets uh, for global digital platforms, and the users contribute significantly to the generation of value and profits. Authorities in these countries should have the right to tax such platforms. And so India, South Africa, they're like, they are major markets for these digital platforms. Uber is a digital platform um, and it's a market here. So they do not pay income tax in South Africa, but they obviously registered as electronic services for, for bad purposes. So the question comes in, where, where should that be taxed? So under the auspices of the OECD, different options are being reviewed, and I'll come to that just now. It says, as the tax landscape evolves in the coming, year, coming years, it is essential to ensure wider, more inclusive participation of developing countries in international discussions on the taxation of the digital economy. As you can see, the basic tax policy is changing because the, 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 the globe is now a single entity. Okay. So what has that impact been on, on the South African uh, economy and the South African tax relations. Um, as a matter of interest, I, I took 
the budget for 2009-2010, the South African budget, and I looked at the relevant importance of different taxes. Now, compared the 2009-2010 to the 2019-20, it's only 10 years. And remember, in 2009-2010, uh, that is after the economic meltdown of 2008, so it, it is not in um, in rosy years. It was it was in recession years. And look at that. At that stage, the company taxes, income tax on companies, which was also 28 percent, contribute 22 percent of the total tax revenue. 22 percent for 2020, that is reduced to 15.91 percent, and the tax rate was the same. It was 28 percent above. The relative importance of company tax from 2010 to 2020 have reduced from 22.1% to 15.9%. And you may think it's not much, but that is a 28% reduction in the relative importance of it. In the same period, the tax on companies' individuals have increased from 34.4% to 38.8%. But remember that the marginal rate went up from 40% to 45%. And but there's been other taxes that that's kind of like compensate for that fuel levy up by a bit, uh, customs duty up by a bit uh, percent, and and the like. So and one what are those reasons for the corporate income tax? One of those reasons, not all the reasons, but one of those reasons, is that there's been this digitization of the economy because companies that used to operate in South Africa, uh, a travel agent that used to operate in South Africa. That job is now taken away by travel store. You don't go through that anymore. And they used to pay tax. And a bookstore that used to sell books, their jobs, uh, that, that company's existence has been, has been taken away by Kindle. Um, and so because those companies' existence have taken away and they are not paying income tax in South Africa, the corporate income tax partially has the relative importance has partially reduced. For that. So the traditional source rules, i.e. where the taxpayer is, is becoming less and less important. The question is now where the customer is, becomes more and more important in the digital economy. And this is an extract from the South African 2020-2021 budget that was made by um, Mr. Mbueni. And it says, taxing the digital economy. In today's digital economy, many businesses are able to generate significant profits in a country without physical presence. The OECD has proposed a unified approach to taxing multinational firms. This approach considers multinationals as a whole and recognizes that consumers and intangible assets contribute to global profits. Under the proposal, multinationals would be required to report a portion of their global profits in all countries where they are sustained and material market presence. So it's looking at market presence. The OECD is looking at market presence. And the proposal forms the basis for negotiations and a hopeful consensus in 2020. South Africa participates in these discussions as a member of the OECD's Inclusive Framework Steering Group, so South Africa is part of this. So let's look at what the OECD actually was saying. So this is the report that, um, that was referred to. And as you can see, there, there are 137 countries participating in this. And this is extracts from, from that report. So what the report says is that they're talking about two pillars, pillars one and two, and if, if this is adopted, Will significantly increase global tax revenues. Why are they saying that? They're saying global companies, when they look at it, the effective tax rate is relatively low. Uh, and it can be because there is a lot of profit shifting, but also there is a lot of dis differences in tax rates throughout the world. So they're estimating that will have a global net revenue gain of 4% of global corporate income tax revenue. So looking at income tax, Remember, we're now looking at income tax and not indirect taxes. And that looks at USD $100 billion annually. Okay. So if they believe that if they can't implement these two pillars, that will lead to further unilateral measures and greater uncertainty. As I said, one of the big issues that the global companies are facing is they're saying there's uncertainty. At the one side, we gain pressure by the public that's saying you're not paying your fair share, but we are complying with the laws as far as we can. There's uncertainty about transfer pricing legislation. There's uncertainty about tax morality. Um, if I have something in a particular jurisdiction and they have a lower tax revenue, um, now I'm saying that I'm not tax moral, but I've made, done it for different reasons. All of that leads to, to great uncertainty. And the OECD is saying, hang on, we need to take all of this away so that it can be more certainty. So, 
This is the result of extensive interaction with stakeholders, obviously of which uh, South Africa is part of, but it's not only the stakeholders in the form of um, uh, the governments, but it includes more than 20 uh, the multinational entities themselves. So there will be there was interactions with the multinational entities themselves. So what is pillar one? So pillar one talks about the reallocation of taxing rights. As I said previously, historically one would look at, at source rules. Where is your service situated? Where is your your the person doing uh, singing the songs situated in Belgium? Where is the the person providing the tax advice sitting? Um, and under pillar one, it says, let's go beyond the physical pre presence to determine taxing rights. We're not looking at physical presence for taxing rights. We're only looking at multinational entities, multinational entities as a whole, rather than entity by entity. So we're also, we're also taking a group, and this in itself is fraught with problems because um, you, you may have outside shareholders. Um, it may vary between um, over 50%, below 50%, over 70%, below 70%, there only be a material interest. So the idea is to look at multinational entities as a whole, but what happens is the idea is to allocate tax base amounts to market jurisdictions based on a formula. So the idea is that there will be routine profit, which is allocated to where your physical presence is, and then the non-routine profits, and then a percentage of that non-routine profit will be allocated according to market. Uncertainty, what is meant by non-routine and routine, because if you take a place like um, uh, Uber um, and uh, Travel Start, that is their routine profit, is to do whatever they do. So the, the idea will become, but, and, and how that mechanism will work is also difficult, because some of that will have to be allocated in globally. So through all of this, South Africa will, for example, get a taxing right on the uh, portion of, for example, iTunes that is, is allocated to South Africa. That will become important. So that the idea is to move, move towards that a reallocation of non-routine profits to countries in where there is a market presence. Well, the two is quite important because what, they, what the idea is to look at multinational entities and say, let us look at your tax rate. That tax rate is below a minimum tax rate that we think is appropriate. So paying all your taxes, everything is there, you're coming out to a global tax rate of 10%. We believe a global tax rate should be 15%. We're going to top you up to 15%. It's uncertain where that will be happening uh, because that can be applied on a global m and &E profit or a jurisdiction by jurisdiction profit. But what they're looking for is then to make it that all global entities, multinational entities, will pay minimum tax rate. So there's no need for them to shift profits. So they're looking at different scenarios and they're saying, okay, scenario one is nothing changes. So the status quo just change, just carries on and, but that is untenable. One can't continue with the basis where, where the economy has moved to a global economy, moved to a, a, a digital economy, uh, but your taxation is, is very much dependent on physical presence. Um, and physical presence in a digital world is also uncertain because where's your server, where's your not server, where is the cloud access? So scenario two, they're saying, let's do a bit of a combination, but let's start with pillar one. So pillar one is obviously, let's look at these global companies and we say, okay, uh, we will now allocate a portion of the profits of this entity to, to South Africa. Let's allocate this. And South Africa will have a taxing right and they will tax it. Obviously, one will need to, there will be a huge amount of changes to double taxation agreements and all of this has to be agreed to. So that is um, um, a scenario two, where it's a combination of just stay where we are and we start moving towards a reallocation of global profits. Scenario three is, is where you take scenario two, so it's staying the same, interaction pillar one, and then what happens is that multinational entities out of their own said, it's, it's not worth our while to put so much effort into moving profits. So there will be a natural uh, increase in the effective tax rate because the, there will be an automated transfer of profits from maybe Mauritius to South Africa or, or from a, a BVI to, to um, Australia, whatever the situation. So they will just, they will just not operate in that basis. And then uh, scenario three is that the low tax jurisdictions will then also increase their corporate income, income tax rate themselves. So that is the scenarios that they're looking at. Okay. So they're expecting that pillar two would raise a significant amount of additional tax revenues because that will take corporate entities and they would have looked at the effective tax rate of the giant multinationals and said that will take that up to a to a different 
um, level and there will be additional amounts that will, will come. And that reform will reduce the profit shifting because why would it be in their interest to, to do profit shifting if they are liable for minimum rate of tax in any event? Okay. So there's a summary. The pillar one is really about reallocating tax taxing rights to market jurisdictions regardless of physical presence. And the pillar two is to require international businesses to pay a minimum level, level of tax. Okay. Um, from a tax policy perspective, there's also a decreased importance of corporate income tax. As I've shown you in South African context, uh, it's reduced from a relative importance for 22% to about 16% in, in 10 years. So its relative importance has dropped by almost 30%. And there's some increased reliance on, on indirect taxes. So what are the other indirect taxes in a digital economy that people are thinking about? Um, there was a lot of talk about a, a robot tax, meaning so if you were to put in, for example, a gantry that will measure your e-tolls, um, that will be subject, that gantry will then be subject to a robot tax because that will take the job away of a person physically collecting your, your, your cash. With the COVID-19, I think perhaps th that is not the right way to go because uh, the robot tax may, is designed to dis, disincentivize investment in technology. But the idea was also to take the proceeds on robot tax to re-educate persons suffering from job losses. So that may still happen because obviously as we go into digital, more digital economies and as this will be a kickstart through this COVID-19, the question comes in, uh, how should you then apply some of these taxes? And what will you do with people that lose their, job, their jobs? So there's also the problems in the definition of a, of a robot. Yeah. Uh, electronic services tax in, in South Africa, the supplies of electronic services must register for VAT. So if you are providing, uh, for example, Kindle books in South Africa, they must register for VAT purposes in South Africa. Ubers must register for VAT purposes in South Africa. Um, even even your, your global um, uh, automotive manufacturers, so if, if they have um, electronic uh, guides available for their dealers in how to um, service motor vehicles, making that electronic platform available in South Africa, they must register for that purposes in South Africa. So the question is this now. And in places like Zimbabwe and some other countries in, in, in Africa, they've implemented, for example, 2% tax on all in electronic payments. So if you, if you pay with, with Zapper or SnapScan or even if your credit card, if it goes to your bank account, there's a 2% tax on that. So that's been criticized quite widely, but it's easy to monitor and, and obviously it will apply to all transactions. When you pay that money, if it goes to your banking system, there's a 2% tax on it. So that is obviously what, what people are thinking about in order to tax this digital economy. So now we've, we've, we've thought about how, how, um, the policy makers are reacting to the digitization of the economy and they're thinking about moving global profits and they're thinking about the, providing taxing rights and they're thinking about minimum tax rates and they're thinking about indirect taxes. And you've thought about how the tax authorities, uh, South African revenue services themselves are thinking about it. They're investing in technology themselves, investing in data analytics, the way that they do uh, audits, the way that you request information. All of those things need to dramatically change. Um, and then uh, the, the impact on the taxpayers, the taxpayers themselves, they are thinking also on tax morality. Where should taxes be paying? They're thinking about things like shared service centers to, to re reduce overheads and to reduce costs. So the question comes in, what is the impact on the tax profession? And uh, at the end of 2018, I attended a, a conference where uh, Daniel Siskind was a, a presenter. And they, Richard and Daniel are the authors of The Future of the Professions. And this is a, a book that is quite eye-opening, and I can really recommend this as a read. Um, so the book predicts the decline of today's professions and introduced the people and systems that replace them. So it's talking about in the with technology, with the digitalization of the economy, what is the future of doctors, teachers, accountants, architects, cl clergy, consultants, lawyers, many others, and how do they operate in in, in the 20th century? And uh, for example, he was, he was mentioning the example of a dermatologist. So a dermatologist is a highly qualified person, a lot of experience. And in the past, they will physically examine you. They will take a, 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 a careful look at, at every single uh, dot on your body and they will, and they will cut a piece of it and send it away. Now there are, there are 
scanners that you stand in the scanner and the scanner will take millions and millions of examples and it will analyze that specific dot in your body and say this is chances are that this may be malignant or whatever the situation so the diagnostic role of the dermatologist could be replaced with a, with a technology and then the question that he asked is is it now only the dermatologist that should be operating that technology or can you get somebody else to operate that technology and you ask those questions in this time the the jobs of teachers have, have had to dramatically revolutionize within a few few weeks um my son is at a, at a high school and he will physically sit in his room and he will be looking at his teacher he can interact with his teacher he can uh, submit all his assignments online and it is accessible uh, but they had to change that overnight uh, normally um, he had to take a bus to school and that takes him an hour to get to school an afternoon back the question comes in is that all necessary and in COVID 19 is that really desirous that that one um, changes that because teaching is still important but then can't we teach better can't we make it better and he asked that question from from a lot of a lot of the professions including accountants including tax consultants including auditors and he asked that um so he's he's making a statement that the future professions explains how increasing capable technologies from telepresence now telepresence is effectively um your video conferencing on steroids um to artificial intelligence will replace and pr the practical experience at the fingertips of, of everyone so it makes it more accessible uh, these webinars that we've hosted between a thousand thousand five hundred sometimes two thousand people have been have been dialing in and be listening to what the the um the presenters had to say it makes it at, at the at, at so accessible for everybody to have the practical experience available and the authors challenge the grand bargain the grand bargain is that they say that professions have created monopolies for themselves so for example uh, it's only a doctor that can do a di di diagnosis of a patient but in our economy um, and the fact that the doctors are so inaccessible we have so many pharmacists and pharmacists can also do certain di di diagnosis and the question comes obviously in there they will not do the diagnosis on the same basis as a doctor but there could be an element of diagnosis that they can do and even though they may make wrong diagnosis perhaps what what they will do and the fact that they've been more accessible will outweigh the negatives of it so there's a grand bargain the grand bargain would be uh, in, in in Gauteng I think all the provinces are barring the Western Cape you're not allowed to access senior counsel without going through a, a firm of attorneys an independent firm of attorneys that is creating a layer of expense that has made senior counsel inaccessible to many and is arguing is that appropriate is that appropriate that there's a monopoly granted to certain things and is arguing that our current professions are antiquated opaque and no longer affordable because of these layers and that and very importantly that the expertise of the best is enjoyed only by a few. As I said earlier, is, is the global is opening also for the small company. But in order to do a transfer pricing benchmarking exercise, it's going to cost you a minimum of 200 to 300,000 grand for, for a small benchmarking exercise. How accessible is that for a small business that just wants to do a bit of business in, in Australia or a bit of business uh, in, 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 in India? Um, or, so the question comes in, is it's not affordable so can technology not make all of this all of this more affordable he raises a different way of open college workers the way that people will be working uh, less formal employed people more people working on contract basis um less barriers and he warned that there will be new gatekeepers so the gatekeeper says sorry you cannot go to senior council and and that is changing uh, and the shared service centers have changed that to a large extent if you for example um, global companies are for example saying let us do our VAT returns in India now obviously they can't submit the VAT return unless you register tax petitions in Africa but they do everything including preparing the, 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 the actual VAT 201 form they give it to a South African person and that South African person just submitted but all the work is being done in India they can even go so far in some instances that South African tax professionals are seconded to India and they are registered tax practitioners in the, and they will review it and that will go off under their, and then, and under their name. So the whole world is, is changing and is questioning whether, whether, um, that is not accelerated. Okay.
So it's also important to look at the nature of knowledge. Now, when I started being a, a tax professional, and that is 30 years ago, the knowledge used to be power. I remember people contacting me and asking me, what is the rules on uh, uniform allowances? And it was a differentiating factor because I knew what the rules on uniform allowances was because I had the book and I read the book and they didn't have the book, so they couldn't read it. Now the question is not um, what is the uniform allowance, it is um, how do I implement a uniform allowance in my total cost of company? Or should I? Can I? So knowledge is cheap, but experience has become more, more powerful. Um, and this changes the way, because the professional used to differentiate yourself in that they say, I possess knowledge that others do not have. If you're a chartered accountant, it used to be, a, you used to come out and you, and you had four years full-time study, then you do your exams, you go three years through articles, at the end of that period, you now qualify as a chartered accountant because you have now passed certain exams and through the three years, you've gained a little bit of practical experience. But you would get there and you say, I now get this title because I know something that nobody else knows. Problem is everybody can have access to every single if it's not a uh, situation and, and that, that is accessible to everybody. So the question comes in, how does the professional now differentiate yourself in an environment where the knowledge is an internet search away? If you want to know what uh, competition law says about something, you just Google it. Um, things like LexisNexis is amazing. There is an uh, immense amount of knowledge available on the SARS website. So it is, it is just there. I've recently dealt with with um, with a, a, a client that asked advice on on the zero rating of certain VAT effects, and the in they were situated in Germany and they could have an intelligent talk about what the South African law talks about section 11 to L the zero rating because they just Googled section 11 to L they looked at 11 to L they looked at commentary on 11 to L and we could have an interesting debate about how 11 to L is is applied in practice. So it's become uh, applicable. I've had a client that is comes from, from, from China, and in our due diligence report, we said that um, there is understatement penalties and quoted the understatement penalties. They came back and said, no, no, but the penalties are different. So they had an outdated version of the, the understatement percentage table, and we just had to tell them that, listen, the table will be updated. But even in, before they interact and before they just trusted our knowledge, they did their own, their own homework. That is how easily accessible knowledge has become. So what you know is less important is how you apply that knowledge to become more and more important. The, the book provides possible, two possible futures for the professions. And the first is they're saying it's reassuringly familiar. It's just a more efficient, effective way of what we're doing. We'll continue doing tax returns. We'll continue doing audits. We'll continue preparing financial statements. It'll just be more efficient. We'll have technology just to just to standardize it and systemize it. So it is streamlined the old way of working. The second future is very different. It involves a transformation in the way that the expertise of professionals is made available in society. Um, as I said earlier, in this past three weeks, uh, the U.S. have relaxed their regulations on, on telemedicine on just to making accessible how doctors can interact with patients and actually be paid for that. Because there used to be, uh, th there's a lot of regulations and there's commentary on, on how th there's you know, uncertainty in that process. But the principle of trying to make medical expertise available to society in a different format through, through um, telemedicine and them actually being paid for that is now transforming it. You don't have to sit in a, in a queue anymore. You can actually have have a, a, a webinar with the doctor and he can talk to you, he can tell you what your symptoms are, you can actually physically show him, you can take a picture of it and show it to him. And the question comes in, is this a, and, and now you come in with things like risk and liabilities and the like, because that always complicates the numbers. But the principle is we are now moving towards that. And are we not forced to move that way? Is this COVID-19 not a catalyst? What's the second future? So also us as tax practitioners, we are sitting here, most of us are working, submitting returns and advising clients and the like, because as, as many of you have said, POI need to be paid, remuneration needs to be paid, VAT returns need to be submitted, ITR 14s need to be submitted. So it's saying in the long run, the second future will dominate. We will find new and better ways to share expertise in society and our professions will steadily be dismantled. Okay, so they're saying that there are three, four questions that need, need to be answered. The first of all, 
is there must be a, a new ways of organizing professional works, making it more affordable, more accessible, more conducive, and with increased quality. Okay. Uh, and again, example, the, the telemedicine. But it's, it's different to many things. Even we have to ask ourselves, the accounting work that we can do, uh, our, our professional work, can it be more affordable, more accessible, more conducive? Okay. Um, and this is very interesting because they're saying, secondly, to who should we allow this to happen? And he says, um, there will be very few, very few jobs for life as things are, cha are, are taken. And what he's saying is that, for example, my previous disorder, uh, where the dermatologist is now the only person licensed to use that technology. Is that correct? Can't you allow somebody else to do the technology, to you apply the technology and give a report that can be cheaper and that can be different? You can walk into a, you can walk into a, a disc game or a, a, another pharmacist and, and say, listen, I want to have my, my body scanned with the scanner. The scanner will then say, okay, we're not seeing anything different. Or if there's something, they can refer you to, to, to the, um, to the dermatologist. And the question comes in even from a tax perspective. A lot of the mundane work can be done somewhere else, and then the actual tax professional work for which you need to be licensed um, and for which you be a registered tax practitioner, that can be the final review. So if if um, Microsoft comes in and they tell the organizations, listen, we will automate your tax returns for you, we'll do an automated VAT return, we'll do automated ITL 14, we'll do all of that. Um, and then all that happens is the licensed tax practitioner will go through it and review it and then submit it. Uh, then a lot of the repetitive work that one currently does in just preparing schedules for and reviewing a schedule for um, legal fees and consulting fees, that may all go away. Then they're asking themselves is, uh, the third question follows from the first two, and, they, and there is no diplomatic way to put it. Okay, Bluntly, then to what extent do we actually trust the professionals to admit that their services could be delivered differently, or that some of the work could be responsibly passed on to non-professionals? So, will the, will the attorneys allow us to have direct access to, to senior counsel? Will they do it? Okay. And, and they say, yeah, if we leave it to the professionals themselves to reinvent their workplace, are we asking the rabbits to guard the lettuce? So, if you allow the doctors to say, listen, it's, if the doctors are the only persons who make the decisions about who can make a diagnosis, then it will always be limited to doctors and it will not be accessible to many because there are too few doctors and they, they, and the pharmacists are not allowed to make any diagnosis. So, so there is, there is pressure. There is pressure. And they're stating here that the future of the professions is too important to be left in the hands of its members. Quite interesting, sir. So they're making the point that the decision for us as tax practitioners as to what our future would be may not lie in our hands. It may lie in the hands of of Google, it may lie in the hands of Microsoft, who will automate what we are doing currently, and who will take all of that away. Because if we are making a life nowadays about doing batch batch reporting, and the technology comes in and it's accessible and it's reliable, where every single transaction autom automatically gets processed through a source system and the VAT already gets paid on a transaction by transaction basis, what can be done? So. Who is in charge? And we have to realize that the future of our profession is not necessarily in our own hands. Okay. So the, the fourth question is, is the grand bargain actually working or a profession's fit for purpose? And in many instances, it's saying it is not. And us as a profession needs to recognize this and we need to make sure. And they say the end of the professional era is characterized by four trends. The move from bespoke services. So... So a bespoke service is, I'll do something specifically for you. People are moving that. Everybody says, but I am unique. I am absolutely unique. And what I do is a very niche service. And the problem is then they move the entire VAT return pr process um, to, to um, India. Um, the, there's a move to bypass traditional gatekeepers and say, well, we, we're not going to worry about moving through registered people. We'll do 80% of the work we'll do offshore, and the rest of it you just need to review and submit it. Yeah. There's a shift from reactive to proactive approach to professional work, and this is important. So us as tax practitioners, we need to recognize that things like just submitting returns, that, that we can't make a life out of that. So what do we need to do? We need to upstream it. We need to be more concerned about um, the tax implications of, of when the transaction actually gets captured. Is it captured right? Is the systems properly geared? Is it properly um, 
coded will have more and more interaction with IT people than, the, than currently. And then the more for less challenge. I want more for less money. Why should I go uh, and and pay 7,000 rand for per hour for service when when I can get it for half the price? So those kind of questions come and say, we want more for less. We want more efficiencies. We want more quality. We want it more accessible. We want it now. We want it quicker. And the professions are also saying that you can't just wait three, four, five weeks for me, for me to give you an answer. I want it now. Okay. So this is this is really where we are going. So from from a personal view, this is just my own personal views. And the accounting and the tax profession is changing dramatically. It it, it is truly changing dramatically. It's changing very very quickly. Um, and we and I think this COVID nineteen period has has been a bit of a stimulus to change this even more. Tax return preparation becoming increasingly automated. There will be a time. And the first to go is VAT returns, then POI returns, monthly POI returns. And over time, even the ITR40s will, will disappear. So, um, tax will pay per transaction, indirect taxes will pay per transactions. And you look at all these batch reporting, uh, skills development, there is UIF, all of these things. There's no reason why it can't be, can't just be automated as you do it. Annual financial statements, currently, they antiquated and historical. The, the, the people making investing decisions are not thinking about financial statements. They are, they want real time information. And there's no reason why real time information can't be given. It does, it's no real time, no reason to wait for a full year to, to, to go past before we actually give accurate financial data. Global companies are getting accurate results out within three days after the end and which for by and large doesn't change at all. So more quarterly and all of that. And the role of the auditors will also change in that, in that there will be more real time auditing. There will be more, um, uh, automated auditing of, of transaction based. So all of that will, will change. Um, regulated automated reporting will be more, more relevant. So let's think about our provisional tax systems. There, from a, from a, currently you do a first and second provisional payment. You do a top up payment afterwards. Um, and then the ITR for you've got a whole year to submit the ITR for, for IT, for ITR 14, a whole year for a company. That is madness. It, sh it, it should be the ITR 14 should only be done once we get to pillar one and pillar two. And then it's only to update it with technology. And if there's interaction with the systems, there's no reason for, for SARS to, to not say, hang on. I believe that your taxable income historically is maybe 20% of turnover. I want you to pay. Um, a tax on 20% of turnover on a monthly basis, and you can move even to a monthly provisional taxes situation, especially when, when the financial data becomes more and more accessible, because there would be obviously a move also to income tax relations to be more regular and is, is twice with a top of payment in the third one and the ITR 14 just being the ultimate check. Would it really be relevant? Um, so the world will be changing it. And us as tax professionals, we have to sit back and say, okay, how do we prepare ourselves? How do we prepare? How do we structure ourselves? How do we structure um, our clients? How do we advise our clients when we're looking for all of, for all of this? So I want to thank you. Um, I, uh, the, the topic for today's webinar was really uh, designed because at this stage we would have been out of the lockdown period and then we could have looked forward. So the lockdown period is obviously now, now extended. Um, thank you for your attention and we really enjoyed preparing and interacting with you through this process. Thank you very much and have a safe and a wonderful day.